you know we politicians we can go on and on we can talk non stop but i might put you to sleep so i'll concentrate on those certain things which i think might interest you number 1 it's important for me to uh, make you realize what is my vision for pakistan my vision for pakistan is the same vision which was of the founding fathers of pakistan the founding fathers of pakistan the great ideological leader ilama iqbal and then our greatest in fact one and the only great leader qaid e azam mohammad ali jinnah their vision for pakistan was that it should be based on the principles of the first muslim state of medina formed by a prophet muhammad peace be upon him now that that medina state was a modern state it was a state which imbibed all modern principles of the most advanced states in the world it was based on two principles justice and compassion they were the basis of the state of medina it became the first welfare state in the history of mankind it became a state where rule of law was such that the head of the state even the head of the state was under the rule of law and one big incident i always give to people that the khalifa the head of the state of the time lost a case against a jewish citizen because the judge would not take the testimony of his son so no one was above law and every citizen regardless of his religion his ethnicity was equal in the eyes of law so number 1 was rule of law and number 2 the first welfare state in the history of mankind where all the weak strata of society were taken care by the state so widows orphans handicapped poor people and pensions were introduced during the state of medina so the old people were were also taken care of by the state so this is what the state was built upon tolerance justice and that state became the basis of one of the greatest civilization in history for the next 700 years pakistan was meant to emulate that state we lost our way we went we went far away from that ideal and if you ask me why pakistan could not achieve its great god given potential it's because of this fact that nations without a vision eventually die there is always a, a vision that keeps keeps uh, uh, members of a human community together when that the re the reason why the human community should have been together when that reason fades away so does that nation so my vision is to go back to to the reason why pakistan was made go back to the vision of pakistan what the founding fathers envisaged pakistan to be so a welfare state even though our country is suffering from probably its worst economic crisis we have already embarked upon making this our country into a welfare state we've started first time health insurance in pakistan for the weakest section of the society we've given almost 6 million 6 million families have been given a health insurance where they can go to any hospital and get basic health care 
Then we've started uh, these shelter homes for people living on the streets. We have set up almost now 200 shelter homes where people can go and sleep, get food, and this program is going to be expanded uh, all over the country. Then we have probably, in Pakistan's history, allocated the greatest amount of money for poverty alleviation in a program called ESAS. And the program envisages giving the poorest of poor cash handouts. We've increased that number. And then, of course, helping them to graduate out of poverty by giving them ways and means of uh, making a living, giving them livestock and so on, educating them skills, loans. Uh, the, uh, the greatest number of scholarships ever given in Pakistan history, again, to the, to the intelligent and poorer section of the society. Uh, this is just the beginning. As time passes, the whole attention of the government is going to be how to lift the poorer section of the society. Uh, in modern day, we are inspired by the example of China, which raised 700 million people in the last 30 years out of poverty. So, allow wealth creation, but use that extra wealth to help the lower section of the society. Close the gap between the rich and the poor. And this, you know, for me, is, uh, is the society we, we want in Pakistan, a civilized society. Um, rule of law, we have a big problem in our country. There's a certain elite section of the society which is above law, which considers it itself above law. We have developed these mafias over a period of time. Cartels use their power to, to artificially uh, uh, raise prices which the poor people have to pay so we uh, uh, political mafias so the so the two tier one to raise people out of poverty second to fight these mafias which are keeping this, this country back so that's in a nutshell my vision of pakistan uh, and let me just uh, now go on to the other reason because this is the islamic center I came to Malaysia this time. Number one, it's always a pleasure to meet uh, our role model, Dr. Mahathir Muhammad, who we consider someone uh, who has, uh, who's a statesman who's changed the destiny of so many people. We have, we, have, uh, we have seen how Malaysia transformed in my lifetime, how uh, Malaysia developed. But what I also like about Malaysia, it's a very civilized society. Why do I say civilized society? I find there is a harmony between religions, between ethnic groups which I think is, uh, as I, I repeat, hallmark of a civilized society. We like, we like to look upon the golden age of Islam. All different religions lived together. There was tolerance, acceptance. Religion was never treated as something which people could be brought in through force. Religion was purely something about the heart and the mind not physical and in Malaysia you see this tolerance the way people live which in my opinion is really to be admired uh, I was supposed to come here in December uh, at a, the KL summit the reason was that we wanted to highlight Islamophobia Islamophobia has grown I spent my early days uh, playing professional cricket in England, traveling the world. Uh, I went to university in England. 
and I, I saw three distinct watersheds when this Islamophobia kept growing. Number one was the Iranian Revolution. Iranian Revolution spread fear in the Western world that the entire Muslim world will be taken over by an Islamic Revolution which will be anti the West. So that was the first time in the Western countries this fear of Islam started. And this idea that uh, this, uh, this uh, revolution will go against the Western interests. So that was number one. Then came 1989. An awful character called Salman Rushdie wrote a book which was blasphemous called Stanic Verses. That became the second watershed because the reaction in the Muslim world to the to the book could not be understood by people in the West because they they needed to understand why were the Muslims reacting to this blasphemy against a prophet I consider that the biggest failure of the Muslim world the Muslim leadership because it was up to the Muslim leadership to explain to the Western people why did it matter to us so much we needed to explain to them that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him lives in our hearts why why do we love him so much why do we respect him so much we needed to explain to people in the Western countries specifically in Europe religion is not taken the way we the way we Muslims live our religion they, there were comedy programs about their religious figures. When I first went to uh, uh, England, I was shocked. They, do, they have a completely different attitude. So we needed to explain to them why was this causing us so much pain. We failed. And from then onwards, in the West, this idea came that Islam is an intolerant religion. It's against the Western values and so on and uh, and so the Islamophobia started increasing from them. Then came 9-11. Now 9-11 was a simply so many criminals, 15 or 16 or however they were, criminals conducting a terrorist act. The big disaster for the Muslim world was that when the when the Western leaders started calling it Islamic terrorism we should have all objected what had their act the terrorist act what had that got to do with Islam there was no connection between Islam, Islam and, the, and those terrorist acts and from there onwards because we did not question them because our Muslim leadership rather than saying that Islam had nothing to do with it delinking Islam with terrorism and especially suicide bombing, suicide attacks. Unfortunately, the Muslim world started also using the Western terminology, moderate Islam and radical Islam. And that, I'm afraid, was the worst thing that happened to Muslims all over, especially Muslims living in Western countries. Because how was, a, how was the common man in the street how was he going to distinguish between a moderate Muslim and a radical Muslim? So all Muslims became, for them, terrorists or radicals. So Islamophobia started growing even more. And because we were not, we the Muslim countries, did not stop and question this, that terrorism and religion have no linkage. Suicide attacks would then also link to Islam because a suicide attacker, when he blew himself up, he was supposed to go to heavens. So this connection meant that Muslims were more prone to suicide attacks. This completely went against historical facts. <clears throat> ja Japanese kamikaze pilots at the end of Second World War did suicide attacks. No one blamed their religion. Tamil Tigers 
In fact, before 9-11, majority of suicide attacks were by Hindu Tamil Tigers. Quite rightly, no one blamed religion for that. But Islam and terrorism got connected. And the result was that you had so many instances of Muslims being uh, uh, terrorized in Western countries, Muslims being insulted, even worse, like that guy in New Zealand who walks into a mosque and shoots 50 worshippers because he couldn't tell what, what was the difference between a normal Muslim and a, and a terrorist or a radical Muslim. So this was the big disservice we did to Islam. Again, I blame the failure to the leadership of the Muslim world. And that's why when I, um, when I spoke to uh, Prime Minister Mahathir in New York, during the United Nations General Assembly and I spoke to uh, President Erdogan, the idea was that we would meet here and we would highlight this and, and form some sort of a media, uh, a media that actually corrects these misunderstandings about Islam, some deliberately done by those who want to demonize Islam, but most of the time because of ignorance and also educate our own young people because because of the mobile phone I, our children now have access to information never in human history children ever had access to such information so there was a re, there was a need to give the children alternate information about you know about the history of Islam or tell them Give them an alternate point of view because this is the world is moving in a direction and with these new technologies like artificial intelligence and big data and all this coming in it is very important that we develop a narrative at least give a younger generation uh, Muslims at least give them an idea of what was the origin what are the misconceptions what is real Islam because that way we will strengthen them. Neither will they fall into propaganda which is blatantly biased against Islam, nor will they go towards the extremes. Because there's an extremist propaganda which is luring our younger people towards uh, extremist ideologies. So that was, what, that was the idea behind, and we are still pursuing it. We hope to come up with a media which gives uh, our children understanding and of course and the non-Muslims that really what is real Islam rather than those people defining Islam who have no idea or who have a bias so that's it I want to listen to your questions